Yo, it's your boy Logos. And it's been a while since I've done a history reaction video. Okay, that's a lie. I just did oversimplified. But this is a different type of video because this time this is Sam O'Neillia. And he goes through different pieces of history with another comedic twist. Just like oversimplified, but this time it's more like a countdown type of format. Either way, I love history. Formats like this make history more accessible to people and it leads to a passion. For me, it was Dan Carlin, and that led to the Roman Empire. But actually, that's not even true. When I was very, very young, one of my earliest memories was seeing Rome Total War on G4 TV. Either that or Walmart. And I don't know why, but just seeing all them soldiers, all the different armies, and the fighting, it just pulled me in. And that led to my love of mythology. Then that led to history. And that led to this channel. But let's get into it. Welcome back, my friends. Today we talk about some decisions that changed history. Oftentimes, history can be changed completely by accident, with witnesses and participants having no idea what a monumental moment they just witnessed. Sometimes last-minute decisions are the most monumental, so today we'll take a look at some of these decisions and their crazy consequences. Number 1. A last-minute officer change doomed the Titanic. The sinking of the Titanic is one of the greatest naval tragedies in history, and also one of the most famous movies of all time. I mean, we all know the story. Big, allegedly unsinkable ship is built, the ship hits a massive iceberg, and finally sinks to the bottom of the sea. But what decisions actually led to this catastrophe? Well, there is plenty of blame to be passed around for the massive loss of life, but the most popular theory is a last-minute decision to switch officers. Second officer David Blair lost his position shortly before the Titanic set sail, and he forgot to hand in his key to a locker that contained binoculars for the lookout. Without any what spare binoculars hell? on hand, the crew had to watch for icebergs using only their eyes. <laughs> Oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm not meaning to laugh at these people because these people didn't deserve to, you know, die in, in this terrible way. But are you, are you kidding me? You're going to try to use your eyes to look out for objects that could kill you, think your ship. By the time you see it, it most likely will be too, you know, late. Oh, that's crazy. Why don't you have backup? I don't care that it was like the early 1900s or whenever it happened. I honestly can't remember. I didn't care to see the movie. I only saw bits and pieces of it. It was like on TNT or USA or, you know, on television. But this just doesn't make sense to me. There's no excuse in that. You don't think to have an extra set of binoculars or like have some that's, you know, already on deck or in the lookout station on like a rack or a hook where it's just easily accessible. That's crazy. That that is insane. I'd be so pissed if I was like Titanic ghost or something. I guess this tactic didn't work out so well. Number two, a wrong turn brought on World War One. Gavrilo Princip was part of the Serbian militant group called the Black Hand that sought to destroy the rulers of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And as it turns out, Gavrilo would be the one to achieve this goal, but not without a lot of luck. On June 28, 1914, Princip and others planned to take out Archduke Ferdinand as his car paraded by. They threw a bomb under the car, but the explosion was delayed and Ferdinand escaped unharmed. Then they tried to shoot him, but the gun misfired. However, luck was on the side of the young militarist. You see, during the parade, they decided to change Ferdinand's route, but his driver somehow missed this fact. As a result, he made a wrong turn and drove right back to Gavrilo Princip. The lucky assassin took this chance and killed Archduke Ferdinand, which is now considered the spark that ignited World War I. That's true, but you could also make an argument that the Great War was already going to happen eventually because there was an arms race. Russia tried to put it into an arms race leading up to the First World War, partially because there was falling behind. Technologically, it up. You know what I mean. In terms of being able to keep up with France and Germany, in terms of weapons, artillery, infrastructure, they was falling behind. So they wanted to stop the building up of arms because they couldn't they couldn't keep up with it. 
And there's an argument that this was sort of inevitable. I think Bismarck even said that it's the kickoff of the next world war or great conflict will be because of some type of incident or event that happens in the Balkans. So, and that's exactly what happened. Right there, smack in the Balkans, and it led to mobilization. And they tried to stop it leading up to the war, but mobilization and people being so fearful, plus the Schlieffen plan in Germany and their timetable, it just made it clearly impossible. Well, not really impossible, but improbable to stop the war. So this definitely, you know, finally kicked it off. But it could have been stopped, but also it probably would have happened anyway in a different type of fashion for a different reason. Number three, a romantic vacation may have saved D-Day. The storming of Normandy on D-Day is perhaps the single most important moment in World War II, at least from an Allied perspective, not for the Germans, especially if they knew that their historical loss may have been caused by a surprise birthday party. I know it sounds strange, but let me explain. The Nazi general might have been brutal, but he had a soft spot for his wife, causing him to plan a surprise birthday vacation for her. Coincidentally, this caused him to leave his post for a few days, right before the Allies attacked. No one can predict history, but had the most skilled German military tactician been present, things could have turned out differently. And kind of, but not really. One of the reasons why he felt so comfortable with going on that vacation is because the Allies went to such lengths to disguise their actual invasion using fake blow-up dolls. Not dolls, but you know, blow-up, um, like fakes of actual tanks and trucks that were just filled with air, but they had an outline and a paint job of an actual truck. So when they have recon planes flying over trying to see what they're doing, it doesn't look like they're actually doing anything in the exact location where they're going to actually invade. I can't remember the exact point that they made them believe they was going to invade at, but that also made, can't, I don't think this was Heinz Guderian or Rommel. I, I can't forget, I'm forgetting his name right now. The exact general that this picture is of, because I don't think they said his name. But either way, all these different factors because of the allies led to him being so comfortable enough to think the invasion is not going to happen while I'm gone. And that takes a lot of work. When you look at a lot of big military expeditions that are successful, it's a lot of preparation, it's a lot of hard work, and it's a lot of trickery. Whether it's Napoleon and his movement and tactics, whether it's Julius Caesar and his way about building fortifications, attacking supply lines, Hannibal going across the Alps, catching Rome off guard and being in their territory and putting them on the back foot and using their aggression against them. Like all these different things is risks people take, but usually if you do it successfully or you plan it meticulously, it will be successful. Without him, the Nazi troops were unable to gauge weather conditions, and the Allies took advantage of this fact. Number four, Stanislav Petrov single handedly. Uh, another thing, too, is Hitler was doing this usual thing of thinking he knows more than actual, you know, wartime generals and holding back troops, reinforcements, tank divisions, which luckily made it a lot easier for the Allies to keep that beachhead and expand further into France to eventually reach Germany and win the war. Of course, with the help of Soviet Russia, but Germany also hurt themselves. And by Germany, I mostly mean Hitler. But you know, he's psychotic, so don't be surprised. Save the world from nuclear warfare. If there is one man every human owes their life to, it's Stanislav Petrov. On September 26, 1983, Petrov was working at his job monitoring the Soviets' early warning systems. Several sensors went off, indicating the U.S. had launched missiles toward the Soviets, which meant it was Petrov's job to begin returning fire. Sensing something was amiss, he quickly decided to delay telling his superiors, knowing the awful repercussions for the world if he did. This last-minute decision saved not just his country, but also the world, since this was indeed a false alarm. If not for Petrov, a nuclear battle would almost certainly have erupted between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, and it would have devastated humankind. Number five. 
people like him deserve statues. I know we give a lot of attention and limelight to, you know, musicians, athletes, celebrities, actors, actresses that, you know, if you really think about it, don't contribute substantially to society. But a man that stopped nuclear war because of his own self-control and critical thinking that deserve a statue in every damn capital of every damn country on this planet. If you ask me, seriously, this guy saved the world. When who knows if somebody else, I don't think, I don't think this is the same situation or same story with the two guys in the submarine, but those two guys too, if it is a separate story, they also deserve statues because they saved the world too. Five clouds saved Kokura from a nuclear attack. We continue with the topic of atomic bombs. Everyone who has knowledge about World War II or recently watched Oppenheimer in cinema knows that the nuclear bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were not planned in incredible detail. Besides intense arguments about whether or not to use atomic bombs, they also weren't sure where to drop the bombs. The original plan was for Kokura to be hit right after Hiroshima, but a young crewman named Kermit Behan determined it was too cloudy to see all of Kokura, so he called it off. This last-minute decision saved every person in Kokura. However, when it comes to Nagasaki, they really got fucked by the weather that day. Number 6. Marie Antoinette's last-minute decisions doomed her family. Marie Antoinette was famously beheaded during the French Revolution, and the backstory of her death definitely doesn't put her in a good light. She and her family could have totally avoided death if it wasn't for some stupid decisions by Marie. All the royals were set to flee in an ordinary carriage, but Marie insisted on the fancier model, which was slower and way more flashy. But no. This had nothing to do with an obsession with luxury. In fact, Marie did not want to be separated from her family, which would have happened if they had taken two of the smaller, faster carriages. Sweet move to stick with your family, but only until all of you get your heads chopped off for it. Number seven, Hannibal. Like, I can understand where she's coming from. Like he said, because if you get separated, they find you and you have to split up. You don't want to be separated from your family. And it would be even more vulnerable, but clearly what you did didn't work out. What you thought or what you planned to do and actually carried out with, it didn't go successfully. I'm not going to say how I feel about them being, you know, beheaded and executed because I don't know enough about the whole situation to get definitive opinion on it. I just care about, you know, Napoleon and everything else after. But either way, it was a dumb decision for you to do that caused an avalanche that killed his army. Hannibal was a famed Carthaginian military leader who was an antagonist of the Roman Empire. He's most famous for leading combat elephants over the Pyrenees and Alps into Rome. In the end, he failed to conquer the Roman Empire, but he may not have failed if it wasn't for a single poke he made with his cane. You see, while crossing the Alps, Hannibal's army encountered a large snowfall, which slowed them right down. Then he tried to prove that the ground they traveled on was still solid, a fatal mistake. Hannibal struck a large snowdrift with his walking cane, which caused an avalanche, which then took out a large portion of his army. Who knows, maybe if it wasn't for that rash decision, the history of the Roman Empire might have been changed forever. Number eight. Eh, maybe, but maybe not. Because even when he had one vulnerable, and I guess you could say, because he didn't attack Rome because his army was weak. He didn't have the same supplies or the same reinforcements that he planned to hope to get, especially from the local Celtic and, you know, quote unquote, barbarian tribes in Northern Italy. And, you know, also, his plan was also to get the Italian allies of Rome and throughout Italy to turn on Rome because, you know, atrial citizenship and that being denied to them, which is a whole crazy story that you really should learn about if you don't know about it if you want to learn about it check out death throes of the republic and the first three or four parts by dan carlin this talks about the gracchi brothers and drusus and all these roman figures that got killed or assassinated and that led to the social war and social and latin and just male ally so the war of the allies of the italian allies against rome itself and that's a whole crazy story definitely check it out but yeah, Hannibal and trying to take down Rome, it was a 
very hard thing to do. He got pretty close to it, but I don't know. If he had that entire army or he didn't lose that portion of it, who knows? He might have lost in a different way. There's no, there's no guarantee. Johann Rahl lost the American Revolution over a poker game. Johann Rahl is a lesser-known German colonel who commanded the Hessian troops that aided the British in the American Revolution. He is most famous for being the victim of George Washington's near-mythic crossing of the Delaware. Intelligence agents actually found out about Washington's plan the night before and handed Colonel Rahl a note about it. However, the colonel was busy playing chess or poker, according to some accounts. Rahl decided to stuff the note in his pocket and leave it for later, but there was no later for him, because he and his entire unit died in the ensuing battle. Number 9. See, that's just an example of sometimes, because I'm an American, and of course I'm happy we won the Revolutionary War, but still at the same time, I can't help but empathize with the soldiers that was under his command who could have been saved and not killed or captured or whatever happened to them because of his idiocy and laziness. That's the thing. When you have certain people in leadership, not because of competence, but because of their status or maybe previous competence, honestly, but they're so focused on themselves or what they want to do in the moment, people get killed. You can only just feel bad for the soldiers on the ground. You see that in World War I and many other conflicts, ancient times, medieval times, even up till now. It's a shame. Teddy Roosevelt was saved by a piece of paper. To be precise, he was saved by his own very long speech, which he had written down. In 1912, while making another run at the presidency as the leader of a new political party, Roosevelt had prepared a 50-page speech. Before heading there, Roosevelt randomly decided to fold up the speech and place it in his breast pocket, a last-minute decision that soon saved his life. During the event, an assailant shot Roosevelt in the chest, but the bullet was greatly slowed by the massive hunk of paper in his pocket. Number 10. Martin Luther King improvised, I have a dream. If there's one historical quote that everyone knows, it's, I have a dream. However, originally, there wasn't meant to be any mention of dreaming. King had an entire speech written and prepared but when Mahalia Jackson, a gospel singer in the audience, shouted, Tell him about the dream, King started to improvise. He began speaking from the heart and disregarded his prepared speech. The result of that last-minute decision was probably one of the most famous quotes and political speeches in history. But that is... That's pretty cool. I actually didn't know that about <clears throat> I have a dream speech. It does remind me of like other eloquent speakers from history like... You know, the Roman ones, whether it's uh, Cato or even Julius Caesar, when he was coming up, he was a pretty good orator. Um, Augustus, he was pretty good at um, political stuff and he came up through the courts. So I was pretty much a, it was a pretty regular way to build up your name in ancient Rome was through the court system and being a lawyer. It gives you a chance to be in front of a crowd, in front of other senators, get a chance to show your speech and how good you are at it. And that was the thing that was very much praised. So that's what I get reminded of when you tell me this type of story about Martin Luther King improvising, because when it just comes from the heart and you're just that good, you're that convinced about what you got to say, even if it's not written down, it can be amazing. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. I don't think I've done one of his videos before. Maybe just one, but I don't think so. But I hope you